I want, uh, I want us to really give a great round of applause, not just for Tim, but for Marilyn. And I think, I know he had a standing ovation yesterday, but I think he deserves another one today. <laughs> Thanks so much. John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's the the trouble is how can I now give a talk? <laughs> I spent the whole night worrying about this because yesterday was so amazing for me. Thank you. I thought anything I say is going to be, it's going to, not going to live up to that. So anyway, let's hope I can do it. Uh, thank you again for everything. That it's really been very, very special. You might think that I'm welcome in my own country, but I've never had a reception like this ever in anywhere. So thank you. You know, I was listening as Asim was talking, and, and I had to conclude this is the most important conference I've ever attended in my life. And I've been going to conferences for more than 42 years. And it's, you, don't underestimate how important it is that what you've heard. It is just incredibly important. So I just wanted to say, Sam, thank you for all you've done. This is an amazing movement. It's an honor. So I could spend hours thanking everyone, but I've already got a talk that's too long, so I better move on. <laughs> so this is about the story behind my trial, and I want to thank Marika Zwaros who's sitting here because she's the co-author. <laughs> and although this is recognized as my book, it's not. It was a joint job, and she produced at least half of the value in this book is what she provided. So I'll begin by the opening acknowledgements uh, because they expressed something that I felt was important. So I, it's, it reads this, I survived sanity intact and that there was a possibility I wouldn't have survived sanity intact. Once you've been through this, you, you understand that it's, it, there are moments when it's, you're on the edge. So anyway, I survived sanity intact, the unfathomable cruelty of the bigotry, the bullying and the betrayal described in this book only because a small group of gracious and tenacious heroes, the righteous and the holy, was guiding my train. Now many of you don't know what I mean by that, and so we refer to this very famous song, the tra This Train is Bound for Glory. And if you don't know the story, it is that during the, before the Civil War, there was still slavery in the United States, the southern slaves could be transported to the north through a train of houses which existed and so that they were 20 miles apart and that would be a night's travel so that a slave who, was, who managed to escape could go from one house to the next, 20 miles apart, that's how far they could travel at night and eventually they would reach the, the north and they would be emancipated. And my favorite music video of all time is about that. So the tra this train is bound for glory is a gospel song which the slaves used to express how they were going to get to the north. And my view is that we're on that train. So... Okay, and so it goes on. <laughs> so, so the tweet that I have sent out that has received the most coverage is this one. 
and it says, this train don't carry no statinators, no sugar sleeves, no diet dictators. This train is bound for glory, this train. <laughs> and Ivor Cummins put this up, and I see he's just walked in, and this is what the book's about. You know, this is the people that we're dealing with are talking to the wall, and this is what they're ignoring. And the book is about the hyperinsulinemia. And I, when I hear people talking the cardiology nonsense, I just think, you know, that's what it is. You're just mumbling to the wall and you're ignoring the elephant in the room. So where, do, where does my story begin? My story begins in Liverpool, and this is for Peter Bruckner, of course, that my parents are from Liverpool. At the end of the Second World War, they went to Africa to start a new life. And we eventually arrived in Cape Town, and I studied at the University of Cape Town. And so this is our university on the slopes of Table Mountain. I spent many hours running behind there, so running became an important issue for me. And when it, whilst I was starting my PhD thesis, I started to work with a guy called Johan Kuslag, who was really interested in post-exercise ketosis because no one had studied it for a long time. And the reason I show you this data is to show you that I could have diagnosed my type 2 diabetes, my insulin resistance, when I was 28, not when I was 58. So, so we did an experiment where we did what... The reason was we didn't know what post-exercise ketosis, what caused it, but my, my wife made the diagnosis because in those days, we would, before a marathon, we'd have three days we wouldn't eat anything, any carbohydrates, we'd eat a high-fat diet, and then we'd eat a high carbohydrate diet. And she told me, your, your breath smells terrible for those three days. So this ketosis, oh, maybe ketosis got something to do with carbohydrates and lack of carbohydrates. So the two of, two of my friend and I ran on the treadmill for two hours on various days. One, when we ate a normal diet, a high carbohydrate diet, and we'd got no ketosis. One day when we did no exercise, that was the control group. And then one day when we'd eaten three, three days low carbohydrates. And so we got this quite nice ketosis. And that, that's kind of one of the first studies showing that, okay, carbohydrates are rather important. But there were two of us. And so we started with quite low ketones, finished with high ketones. But here was the interesting stuff, which I only discovered and went back to years later. So we also measured free fatty acids, glucose, and insulin. And the key is to notice that when we exercised on the high carbohydrate diet, our glucose went up, the two of us. And that's actually unusual. And I think that's a mark of insulin resistance. I'll come back to it. But really what happened, look at when we did the no exercise, this was my, our fasting insulins. They were about five times normal. And they only dropped back. In fact, they still weren't normal after a whole day of not eating. So the answer was that the two of us were profoundly insulin resistant despite the fact that we were running marathons and we were both extremely lean at the time. So, so there we were, high glucose, which got worse during exercise. It should never. Every study you look at, glucose stays normal during exercise. So there's something going on there. And I think that might be a good marker of insulin resistance is if your glucose goes up during high intensity exercise. And then the insulin. So here I was profoundly hyperinsulinemic put it simply that people said you'd ate this high carbohydrate diet for 33 years and it made you healthy and then you converted to a high fat diet and with three months you'd develop type 2 diabetes. So they, they ignored the 33 years of a person with insulin resistance and a high carbohydrate diet. So, so the answer was that Tim Noakes and the friend had insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, despite youth and marathon training and it improved on the high fat diet. You could see that. And they must develop type 2 diabetes with time if they continued eating a high carbohydrate diet, which I did, as I'll show. My friend, I don't know, he went to New Zealand. I haven't caught up with him. So while we were doing these studies, we became world authorities on carbohydrate metabolism during exercise. And that was what I became well known for. And the reason we became well known for because we because we were able to study liver metabolism, muscle metabolism, and also we looked at what happens when you take in carbohydrates. So we did intensive studies for about 15 years on muscle glycogen use during exercise. So we, we knew all these pathways, we worked them out, we quantified exactly where each gram of carbohydrate was coming from. We quantified exactly what's the best things to drink during exercise to give you additional carbohydrate. We even studied lactate coming from the inactive muscle and being oxidized. So I'll say this, the point I'm making is we really studied carbohydrates at great length. 
And what we didn't worry about was fat oxidation. It wasn't on the agenda. We completely ignored it. And so here are some of the studies that we did. Andrew Bosch did this for his PhD. So we had people exercise for three hours at about 70% of their maximum. And we showed that energy from muscle glycogen fell. The, the energy from blood glucose increased with time. And that made us worried because you might get hypoglycemic if the liver can't produce the glucose. Where is it going to come from? You're going to collapse and die of hypoglycemia. And here we use a, there's a little bit more fat oxidation. But when you take carbohydrates, you don't burn as much fat. That must be good. <laughs> it must be good because this is the way you want to be. You want to just burn muscle glycogen. That's going to make you run faster. And so in hindsight, it seems that we wanted to prevent all fat oxidation. All carbohydrate research tries to shut down all fat oxidation. But we couldn't see that at the time, nor do still many still to do today. They don't understand that. And then we even studied what happens if you provide exogenous carbohydrate from drinking. And we showed that if you provided exogenous carbohydrate, you could spare some of the glucose coming from the liver. And gosh, that's going to be good because you're not going to run out of glycogen in the liver. You're not going to become hypoglycemic. So that's going to be even better. And so the focus was and is on maximizing carbohydrate use and sparing glycogen by increasing exogenous glucose delivery. And that's why Gatorade tells you you must drink 100 grams of carbohydrate every hour that you do the Ironman. Those are the dietary guidelines. So in a 10-hour Ironman, you must eat a kilogram of carbohydrate or else you're not going to finish. But the best way to spare muscle glycogen use is to burn more fat. So, so, but, we, but we couldn't see it. Now, I'm trying to make the point that when you become so engrossed in a dogma, you can't see the wood for the trees. And that's what happened to us. So at, then at the time, I was involved with this guy, Bruce Fordyce, who became the, the sort of iconic South African runner. He won this famous Comrades Marathon race nine times, which has never be equaled. And, and we worked with him, and we got him to take lots of carbohydrate during the races. And I even got him to tell me this, you see. It's not possible for me to run my best in a long-distance race without ingesting a high-carbohydrate drink, especially for the last few hours of the race. He has since converted to the high-fat diet, and he said, Tim, you know, we made one error. <laughs> if you'd put me on the high-fat diet here, I would have won another 10 comrades. <laughs> and why? Because he put on weight. He put on two kilograms, which is a 50, for a 50-kilogram guy, the two kilograms makes a difference. And we produced a product. The first energy goo in the world was produced by myself and Bruce. And it was called FRM. Here you are. There's Lepin Sport, Four Dice, Rose, Noakes. Squeezy is the original carbohydrate gel produce available to endurance athletes. This is someone else has written. So that's, so I apologize for, for doing that. <laughs> so, so why were we wrong? Why were we wrong? Because we couldn't see the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that. It's the fat. That's, we just ignored it. So, and you have to ask why. Well, because no one was selling products that, that we could test. And it's very difficult to study fat metabolism. It's easy to study these. They're all, there are radio labeled traces that you can use, but the fat traces are very difficult to study. So we became experts on this because this was difficult and we just ignored it. It didn't matter. And this is the problem. This is the elephant in the room, that this is how much fat you have in the body, fat energy, and this is how much carbohydrate energy you have. So, you know, so how can you continue to ignore it, and which, which we did? So it's been estimated, as you all know this, that adipose tissue stores alone could supply sufficient energy for nearly four days of running compared to less than two hours using only muscle glycogen. And there are many athletes around the world who are now running the Ironman or doing 100-mile races without eating at all. And it's obvious. Once you get your fat oxidation rates up, you, can, you don't need carbohydrate at all. So, so I apologize for 33 years. I was completely wrong and didn't see the elephant in the room. So I understand it. Now, and what the other elephant in the room was that the great athletes in, that we, after the war, uh, right up to the 1969s, were not eating high carbohydrate diets. And you just ask them and they'll tell you this. Jim Peters, probably the greatest marathoner of all time, an Englishman, uh, who, say, who lowered the world marathon time by about seven minutes over three years. It's just astonishing. No one has ever touched that. So he wrote, we were still rationed for meat and none extra could be obtained. At the time of the 1948 Olympics, we were given extra meat and also received food parcels from overseas. 
But by the 1952 Olympics, we weren't so lucky. People had forgotten about Britain and they weren't going to supply food to the poor, the British who were starving. The only thing that could be done was to try to make up with extra bread and potatoes, <laughs> which is probably not the best food on which to run over 100 miles a week in training. So how can the greatest runner of all time at that time say this, but yet we were trying to force people to eat carbohydrates? So this really began to change, and by Steve Finney uh, started to change this in 1984 when he published this paper. And this was the first modern study of fat adaptation. And he put five people on a high-fat diet for four weeks. And this is what he found. He showed that this is the exercise performance before minutes to exhaustion at 65% VO2. It's not a great test, but anyway, it's good enough. And what he found was that for two people, the results dramatically increased. And for two people, they dramatically worsened, and one was pretty much the same. Which is really interesting because of the individual variability in the response. And so he probably might have concluded that for some people it's really beneficial, for others it's actually horrible, and for some people it's kind of neutral. But he concluded that four weeks of adaptation to the ketogenic diet resulted in no change in endurance performance. What really influenced him was his father had a massive library, and in his father's library he found this book, The Long Arctic Search. And these guys went to look for the Franklin expedition that got lost looking for the Northwest Passage. And it's one of the great tragedies that these people just got lost and they, they found them. Eventually, these guys found them. So the author, he has the author talking to the local, the Inuit, who, who helped them and fed them while they were looking for these, these ships. And this is what, he, what Steve Finney had rec read in the book. When first thrown wholly upon a diet of reindeer meat, it seems inadequate to properly nourish the system. And there is an apparent weakness and inability to perform severe, exerting, fatiguing journeys. But this spoon passes away in the course of two or three weeks. So that was why he thought, yeah, most of the studies have been too short duration, but if we do a longer study, we may find that fat adaptation works. And that influenced us. So now here we are promoting carbohydrates, telling Bruce he can't win the comrades unless he eats lots of carbohydrate. But behind the scenes, we're doing studies of high-fat diets. So I only look back now and think, well, what were you thinking? So, sorry, sorry. And the, one other thing before we get there. The, I'm from Zimbabwe. I was born in Zimbabwe, and this lady was also born in Zimbabwe. Her name is Paula Nubi Fraser. Many of you won't know, but she's one of the greatest athletes of all time. And she went to America to become a professional triathlete. And here are some pictures of her victories and her racing. And it turns out that she won 28 Ironman triathlons, including eight world championships. No male has ever reached that, equaled that. And she was named the triathlete of the millennium. When she got there in 1984, she phoned me because she'd read Steve Finney's work. And she said, Tim, should I adopt the high-fat diet? And I said something to her. So misinterpreting my advice, I said, yes, go for it. She, fo <laughs> <laughs> she followed a low-carbohydrate all her career. I never said eat a low-carbohydrate. I said just eat some more fat. She believes it was the most important advice she ever received in her entire career. <laughs> And she said, you can't train for the Ironman on pasta and salads. And, so, and she asked her, but Paula, why? She said, well, I grew up in, in Zimbabwe, and we were always eating meats. We were always chewing on biltong. That's the, the beef jerky. And that's what she would eat in the Ironman. She would eat meat <laughs> as she was doing the Ironman. And there she is, and there's a typical, you can tell that this is a carnivore. <laughs> So, so while this was going on, I was, we were inspired to do some high-fat studies. So here's one, enhanced endurance in training cyclists during moderate intensity exercise following two weeks adaptation to a high-fat diet, published in 1994. And so here were the results that actually when these people, we tested them, we did a couple of pre-tests, so they, they were glycogen depleted. And guess what? The high-fat diet, they did much better than on the high-carbohydrate diet. My point is, I'm still not accepting this. I'm still promoting a high carbohydrate diet. And he has another one, which, which was a very similar study. And we found that if we train these people and then we put them back on a high carbohydrate diet for the last day before competition, they actually did better. Their performance was quicker in a 20K time trial after the high fat diet. And, but this was two weeks. They'd adapted for two weeks. And then we made the terrible error of doing this study. And this now became the gold standard. 
This is called by Louise Burke, who you were introduced to yesterday, the nail in the coffin study for the high fat diet during exercise. So this was one of our PhD students. And what she did, we did 100K time trials so that they did a high carbohydrate diet. Uh, sorry, here we go. They did a high carbohydrate diet followed by one day of carbohydrate loading. So it was six days and one day. And then they did a time trial over 100 kilometers. And then, the, the, of course, they were randomized also due to a high fat diet. And what you'll see is that one, two, three get worse on the high carbohydrate diet. And one, two, three, four, five get better on the high carbohydrate. So it's five to three, which is very similar to what Steve Finney had, had found. And overall, there was no difference. But unfortunately, we also reported the data. And it turns out that when they did the, the four kilometer splints, sprints, they were slightly slower for the second and third, but not for the fourth. So the final sprint was exactly the same in both groups. And what was happening, they were pacing themselves because they hadn't been experienced to this diet. And that was interpreted that the second and third sprints were weaker because there was the carbohydrate effect or the fat effect. It wasn't the case. In my view, they were pacing themselves because they, certainly, they weren't used to using the diet. And that was picked up and it was said then the conclusion, that was the conclusion. Their conclusion was this, that you compromise its high intensity sprint performance. But we actually didn't show that. We showed that their pacing was different. Now, all this time, we've also did this study, also with Dr. Louise Burke, did the study with us, in which we used the first placebo ever in a carbohydrate loading trial. And guess what? We found no difference. So, carbohydrate loading versus placebo, there was no difference in time to perform these, these 1K and 4K sprints or the total time. So this disproves the high carbohydrate diet. This is now 2000. And one of the co-authors is a lady who called me a criminal, but she also doesn't tell her people that the carbohydrates didn't work. So what did we write? In, in a placebo controlled study showing that carbohydrate loading did not improve performance of a 100K cycling time trial during which carbohydrate was consumed. So that, the, the, the null hypothesis is therefore carbohydrate loading doesn't work. But what does Tim Noakes write? Because he can't, get, can't release the old idea, he has to have an ad hoc explanation. And that ad hoc is by preventing any fall in blood glucose concentration, carbohydrate ingestion during exercise may offset any detrimental effects on performance of lower pre-exercise muscle glycogen and liver glycogen concentration. That is garbage. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens. And the biggest example of that is the Women's Health Initiative because they did exactly the same. The null hypothesis was that a low-fat diet will not in change your heart attack risk. It didn't. So the Women's Health Initiative should have been reported. There was no difference. Therefore, the low-fat diet doesn't work. Not they said, oh, no, it didn't drop the cholesterol enough, and not enough women followed the diet properly. No, no, no. You can't do it that way. So we're all guilty of this, uh, of, of doing that. Yeah, I think this, was the, this is the slides. For, it got out of sequence. So this is now we're going to go back to the, the high-fat diet. And here you see these are the 1K sprints during a 100K time trial. And what you see is that the group on the high-fat diet, on the second, the third, and the fourth sprint, they're actually lower. But on the fifth sprint, they're the same. So if it's a metabolic effect, it can't be working here because it's not working there. So there cannot be. There cannot be a metabolic effect. It's a pacing strategy. <laughs> And when they did 1K sprints, they were fine. Or, yeah, that's, uh, these, sorry, these are 4K sprints, they were the same. So we misinterpreted that information. And so conclusion, the high-fat carbohydrate dietary pattern increased fat oxidation but compromised high-intensity sprint performance. And that's not, I don't believe it, I think it changed the pacing strategy. So this is in the background, and during this time I'm writing this book. In 1986 I write it, this is 2002. And so despite all that I've shown you, Please understand that what I've shown you, what do I conclude? I conclude athletes must be advised to eat high carbohydrate diets. And why? Because I was being funded by industry. And that's, that's why you conclude that. And it, you don't think it affects you, but it does. Because the only thing you're worried about is, am I going to have money for next year? That's, that's what it becomes. And you, I, I don't say that that's not true, because obviously you're looking for the truth. But you, you're always behind the scene, you're believing this thing works, because it has to, because that's where the funding comes from. So it's very subtle, and people don't do it because they think they're cheating. They don't actively do it. It just happens that way. 
So this interpretation forms the central pillar of the profession of sports nutrition. It's high carbohydrate diets and are considered ideal for both health and sport. That is 2002. Now following my own advice, I developed type 2 diabetes despite running 70 marathons and ultra marathons. And so what happened next was that I started to question a few things. So here's a picture of me graduating with my MD in 1981. On my, that's my mother, obviously, and that's my father. And they're very proud because they gave me the opportunity to go to university, which they did not have. And these are two very special people, obviously. <laughs> Excuse me, I get a bit emotional. My dad is 68, I'm 68 today. He had just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Ten years later, he was dead. And he had the worst death possible, because that's the diabetes death. He'd had strokes and he lost both his legs. And it was just, he could not speak to me when he died. So now, at 68, uh, I've, I've actually had diabetes diagnosis for eight years, so am I going to die in two years' time? That was the question I faced, actually, when I made the diagnosis. Was I going to last 10 years and die like him or not? And so I had to think about doing it differently. Now, this was the advice my dad was given. And I don't blame this lady at all, because she's a personal friend. But this was, this was a book that was available to him, that she wrote, funded by... Yeah, yeah. SA Sugar Association. And nowadays the diet recommended for diabetics is high in complex carbohydrates and low in fat. So that was the advice he was given. And the point is, I know now that that, diet, that advice killed him. That's the key. Diabetes, you don't die of diabetes. You die of the treatment. You die of the management of the disease. And that's the crucial point. And so then this, we fast forward to South Africa 2014, and this is the advice that's being given. Carbohydrates are an important source of energy in the body, and glucose, which is the product of the digestion of carbohydrates, is the only source. Of, I mean, it's just, this is simply wrong. But, and why is it wrong? Because in diabetes, you have hyperglycemia. You've got too much glucose. So why should you be worrying about glucose being too low? It is nonsensical. And my point is, my father did not die from hyperglycemia. He died from disseminated arterial disease. And that is what type 2 diabetes is. You have to address the disseminated arterial disease. So I was fortunate that on December the 12th, and I can remember the day, 20, December the 12th, 2010, this book appeared in my life. And it came up on my screen on the emails, and I was so angry. Because here's Steve Finney, the guy who did the high-fat diet. And he was a great scientist, and now he's sold out to Atkins. And I was so angry, I rushed down to the store and I bought the book. <laughs> and two hours later, I said, oh my gosh, I got it completely wrong. And I changed that moment and I, had my, I said, that's it with carbs, I'm not eating carbs anymore. And, and you know, we, we need to recognize this guy because he describes insulin resistance. That book's all about insulin resistance and it's a, it's a magnificent book, it's the best book on on diets, in my opinion. So we really need to recognize him. So then, uh, so now I've started my journey, I've changed my diet, and within a, six weeks, my running gets better going back 20 years. I go back from a 60-year-old to a 40-year-old, and that was just unbelievable for me. And so now, of course, I'm completely committed. There's no way I'm not going to be committed after that. <laughs> and then, of course, I read Gary Taubes' book, and then, I wrote, then eventually I had to acknowledge that I changed, so I wrote this book, and here it says how a low carb, it shouldn't be that, should be moderate protein diet, will improve your life. So this was the, the book I wrote, and now this then caused, started the problems for me, <laughs> because the cardiologist read this, and I said that statins are not the treatment for heart disease, etc. And so that's when the campaign against me started. And, and as I describe in the book, when I realized I was in trouble, was I was awarded the, the premier science research award in South Africa on that particular evening. And within, 30, within about two minutes of receiving the award, my cell phone rings. And it's from the newspaper. And they say they've got a letter in the newspaper criticizing me for what I've written in this book. It's clear it was timed. Because in the next morning's paper, it didn't say Tim Noakes awarded the best, the senior award in science. It was about Tim Noakes attacking being wrong and the cardiologist telling him he's wrong. It was clearly coordinated. So that, that was the start. So anyway, that was the beginning. And then I wrote this article because now people were writing to me. 
And they were telling me these stories, and I was getting these unbelievable stories about people reversing diabetes and other conditions. So I described 127 cases. And within a week of this being published, I got a letter from my ethics board at the university saying you got, didn't get ethical clearance to publish this paper. They wanted to withdraw it because it was so threatening, because it, there it is. I think we, we said here, a randomized controlled clinical trial is urgently required to disprove the hypothesis that the low-carb eating can reverse cases of type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and hypertension without pharmacotherapy. And they were so threatening. So this is now in 2013. And then the next thing that happened was these two guys came and spoke to me with the nutritionist and said, let's write a book. And the story was that David Greer is a runner, and he had run the length of the Ch Wall of China, the first person to do it with another person. And they'd reached Mongolia, and they were in real trouble. They were wasting away, and they didn't have any energy. And they were told by the Mongolians, you better eat pork fat, or you're not going to finish. <laughs> so they said, we're eating pork fat. And they ate pork fat for the rest of the run. And it's funny, because he also ran the length of India, from, sorry, the, the depth of India. And of course, he was getting mainly carbohydrates. And eventually, he got so weak, he decided, I've got to eat chicken. So he decided, I'll eat a chicken a day. And as he started eating his chickens, his distance he traveled every day went up and he became much healthier. So these two guys said, let's write a book. And we wrote the book. It took five weeks to write it. And this then changed the whole nutrition landscape in South Africa because people started following the diet, losing the weight, getting all the benefits and realizing that actually the dietitians couldn't help them. And so now this is a huge threat for the dietitian's profession. And I'll show you what the consequences were. And the genius of the book is the green list. And this just is the list of the foods that you should eat. And that's, that's it. You know, the, the genius in the book is that one single page, which I didn't give. Sally Creed gave it. And uh, the, if you eat that diet, you, you're not going to get type 2 diabetes. Then, of course, I read a, a, a few months later, I read Nina Teichel. And then I said, I can't believe this book. It's saying exactly what I've been believing, but could never really believe it was true. So and there's, this is the final statement in her book. If you haven't read it, I'm sure you have. The advice that comes out of this book is that a higher fat diet is almost assuredly healthier than one low in fat and high in carbohydrates. The most rigorous science now supports this statement. And Asim has given his article about the saturated fat, which came out in 2013. And this, his article plus that convinced me that now we were on the right track. So then what next happens is the trial begins. And this is just to, this is one of the local newspapers. And this is October 19, 2016. So this was the end of my testimony. And at one point, apparently, I said that. <laughs> and so let's go back now. We'll start the trial. So why do I use Twitter? I use it for information sharing. And I think if you go to my site, you'll see that, that I, inf I, clear, I try to share all the latest information that I pick up from other people who are providing it. In my personal education, I download about five or six articles a day and store them. And I don't know when I'll ever get to read them, but they're stored. And I've <laughs> my inbox is just full of articles so that there's, there's personal education. And it's actually overwhelming. The information out there is overwhelming. As, as Peter Bruckner showed us yesterday, you know, the, the, the quality of the information is amazing. And then the third one is challenging conventional dietary guidelines. So I try to promote the science supporting the medical benefits of the low-carbohydrate banting lifestyle, at the same time highlighting the failings of the current pharmacological model of chronic disease management. And so obviously, this is what gets focused on when, when you're criticized, and, and you, people don't, don't realize that you're sharing good information and you're trying to educate people. So now we come to the start of this catastrophe. So on February the 3rd, 2014, Mrs. Pippa Lienstra tweets this comment. Is LCHF, and she sent it to me and to Sal Creed, the co-author of the book. Is LCH eating okay for breastfeeding moms worried about all the dairy and cauliflower causing wind in babies? Question mark. And, and the point of this is that it's a plural. It's a question in the plural. And that means anything you do thereafter, you're just giving general information, which you're entitled to do so. That all the guidelines in South Africa are that. That is fine. You, if it's an eye question, if it's a baby and a mother, then it's direct in medical advice, and it falls under a different category. So knowing that, I said, baby doesn't eat the dairy and cauliflower, just very healthy, high-fat breast milk. 
And then the, pro the catastrophe key is to wean, which I didn't even know how to spell wean. Baby on tail spectrum. And there was a whole story about we don't use the word weaning, we're talking about complementary feeding, and that just shows how ignorant you are if you don't know that you... So, so then this is the problem. So I tweeted uh, on the afternoon of Wednesday, and the next morning uh, this is sent to the Health Foundation, the Health Professional Council of South Africa by this lady who's the head of the president of the Association of Dietetics in South Africa. And she says, to whom it may concern, I would like to file a complaint against Professor Tim Noakes. He is giving incorrect medical, and it should have medical something, but it doesn't, it's medical nutrition therapy, which incidentally is, would be using a ketogenic diet for epilepsy. And that wasn't what I was talking about. On Twitter, that is not evidence-based. I've attached the tweet where Professor Noakes advises a breastfeeding mother to wean her baby onto low carbohydrate, high fat diet. I urge the HBCSA to please take urgent action against this type of conduct, misconduct as Noakes is a celebrity. And the public does not have the knowledge to understand that the information he is advocating is not evidence-based. It especially dangerous, dangerous to give this advice for infants and can potentially be life-threatening. I wait your response. So they then, uh, then wrote to me and I responded, and eventually, as we'll describe, they decided to charge me. And so the charges fell under the biomedical ethical issues. I acted disgracefully because I abused the doctor-patient relationship by offering medical advice on social media to a patient and her infant without first examining the healthy patient. And the second one, the biomedical biological issue, the medical advice I proffered was not only wrong, unconventional, i.e. not evidence-based, but it was also dangerous although there was no ever, never any evidence or claim for harm. And of course, this was a circular argument in a sense, because providing medical information on Twitter represents disgraceful conduct because it's not possible to examine the patient on Twitter. But it's not possible to examine the patient on Twitter, then it's not possible to have a doctor-patient relationship on Twitter. <laughs> but they kind of, <laughs> what they eventually did in, as the, pro, the trial progressed, they said, no, 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 we're not interested in a doctor-patient relationship anymore, which was the basis of the charge. They said, no, 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 you are tweeting to millions of people around the world and they're getting the wrong advice and it's very dangerous. You're going to kill patients. That became the charge. So they went away from it when they realized that there wasn't a doctor-patient relationship. But the, the trial was so poorly constructed, this is the way they had to do it. So the, the charge meant, if a, pa so if a patient wishes to form a doctor-patient relationship via Twitter, they simply ask for one's contact details. And she didn't do that. And a lot of people do that, say, I'd like to consult you. Where, how can I contact you? Patients resort to Twitter to acquire information that will allow them to optimize their, the care that they receive from the medical profession. They're simply using a convenient platform to find medical information. They're not looking for medical care unless they specifically ask. That would be the argument. Now, so this was the basis of the charge, and then it went to this preliminary committee who had to decide now, do they charge me or not? And what they are meant to do is they are meant to gather all the information on the, the prosecution side. They gather all your information and you are allowed to come before them and say, listen, this is what the story is. I was never given that right, which is completely against the, the constitution of South Africa. My constitutional rights were invaded by that. I was not given the constitutional right. And these were the, the people, I'll call them people, who decided to charge me. And... I, this guy was my professor at university. This girl was at school with my sister. And they still didn't ask me for anything. And you ask why? Well, they represented the South African Medical Association who'd taken a position against me. So they were just spokespersons for that. And the question was, have they ever been on Twitter? Do they understand Twitter? Well, there's no evidence that any of them has ever been on Twitter. They haven't a clue what Twitter's about. And they're trying to judge a thing like, like this. So there was no evidence. So the problems for the Health Professional Council was I answered a we question. And here's an article written in the South African Medical Journal by a lady writing about ethical and legal perspectives on the use of social media by health professionals in South Africa. This is written while the case is, is in, in court, because partly because they wanted to clarify. And what does she say? She said, the, it is advisable that professionals share generic information online. So you're encouraged to do it and avoid responding with direct medical advice to individuals. So she's saying answer a, a we question, but
but don't answer an I question, which is exactly, of course, what I did. And then she said, as a standard precaution, it should be mandatory that any medical discussion professionals enter into on social platforms be accompanied by advice that patients must consult their practitioners. Well, of course, this is nonsensical, because if they'd consulted their professionals, if they had faith in the professional, they wouldn't write to you. So, <laughs> so that's nonsensical. And she also doesn't really understand the nature of Twitter. But anyway, that, so I responded with a letter in the South African Medical Journal. This is not really to do with the trial, but it's just kind of to, to, to lay the ground. And, and I made the point, this is the distinction is the difference between responding to an I or a we question. The question I answered was a we question seeking generic medical information, which of course she agrees was acceptable. Any doctor willfully attempting to enter a doctor-patient relationship on Twitter, you must very likely act unprofessionally since there's a high probability the act of treating a patient on Twitter would involve supersession. As soon as you do that, you are probably going to supersede someone. This is because patients resorting to Twitter are not actually seeking medical care, so they have no reason to address any requests to their professional caregivers. And the whole irony of the trial was that the lady who reported me immediately wrote to Pippa Lienstra and said, consult me, I will give you advice. So she superseded me and she gave medical advice on Twitter. So she broke all the rules that she was accusing me of breaking. And there was another dietitian who did exactly the same. So that was the first problem. The second problem, there was no doctor-patient relationship. There, and I, we established that in the trial, that there was none. And the, the telling point uh, in the, we've had a, an appeal quite recently, was the magistrate hearing the appeal, came, he went through all the tweets, and the final tweet from Lienstra says, I'm confused by all this information. He said, there you are. She was just looking for information. She wasn't looking for medical advice. So he then realized, I hope, because he hasn't given his final decision, I hope he realized that there was no doctor-patient relationship. Then Dan Nsiani, who's the president of the South African Medical Association, a great friend of mine, he wrote this editorial, which in another publication of the South African Medical Journal, saying, today medical advice outlets are ubiquitous all across the globe via both print and electronic media. But it's never been suggested that Dr. Oz has a doctor-patient relationship with his viewers. Nor has such a relationship ever been purported to exist in relation to any other medical media advisors on platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, TV, or radio. And he said, what was all the kerfuffle about? I don't know if you know what that term, what's all the nonsense about. So why was I treated differently? And is it to set an historical precedent? I, that became one of the real questions for us. So there was no doctor-patient relationship. The, the, and then the final, well, not the final, but the really important point, the information I provided is entirely compatible with South African and international guidelines for complementary feeding of infants, which had been drawn up by the individuals who were trying to prosecute me, by the very witnesses across the thing. Had, so, so let's look at that. Here we go. This was the, suitable complementary foods. Meat, poultry, fish, and eggs should be eaten daily or as often as possible. That's exactly what I said. And she was an expert witness for the prosecution <laughs> against me. <laughs> and then this is Adsa, who also had been in the prosecution. Foods from animals should be eaten daily or as often as possible to meet protein and iron needs. So that's Adsa, who are also prosecuting me. And then this dear lady, Esty Forster, who, <laughs> who was now, she, wrote, she was this, the principal prosecution witness. She drove the whole case for the prosecution. So what are her guidelines? From six months of age, give your child meat, chicken, fish, or egg every day or as often as possible. <laughs> so we, did, we detail the stories about Dr. Forster in the book and, and you know, how she was, her, her, within five minutes, my legal team had completely destroyed her credibility because they showed that she was not trained as a dietitian. She'd never given dietary advice. She knew nothing about ethics, although she was presenting herself as an ethics expert, and she'd never done a low-carbohydrate diet ever. She'd never done studies on low-carbohydrate diets. So Rocky Ramdas, who you'll meet in a second or two, so he said, well, why are you here then if you've got no expertise? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said this, on, I said this on, on, when I was being interviewed yesterday. There's, there's a word in South Africa which is kind of a bit like the F word, but it's called cis. You see, cis says that's completely dismissive. So the only word she said to me in the 28 days of the trial was cease. <laughs> and that was after she came off the, off the stand 
having been interrogated by Dr. Rocky Ramdas, she said to me, sis, and walked away, and that was it. <laughs> so, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> oh, sorry, by the way, sorry, sorry, sorry. She funded by SA Sugar, funded by Nestle, and she was also the president of ILSI, the International Life Sciences Institute in South Africa, which is a Coca-Cola front. Yeah. So, and there, look here, this is what the book says. This is what you should be eating. This is exactly what dear old Hesty had said you should be eating. No one suffered any harm. Miss, Mrs. Leonstra didn't follow the advice, nor did she lay the complaint. So the, the lady who wrote the, the letter or the email, she said, I would never follow that advice. It was so stupid. I would never consider putting my son on that diet. And so here she is, and it's in Afrikaans, and she says, I don't give a damn for this trial. That's what she said. Ek me. I don't feel a feather. I don't feel anything about it. And here's her son, who might have been on the banting diet, and I think he'd look healthier if he had been on the banting diet. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, in a trial like this, you can ask for freedom of information, and so you can get emails. And the one set of emails we needed, we got, but there's another set which are hidden, and they've refused to give it to us. And I think that if we lose the case on the appeal, we will go and find that material, because that will show the real depth of the collusion. But there was frank collusion. The complaint was laid as part of a collusion between ADSA and the HPCSA with the purpose of silencing me, that is denying me my constitutional right of freedom of speech. And we've got absolute evidence that, that was the case. And what is that evidence? Here's an email chain between Yilsing Stratum, which was sent to this lady, Professor Wenzel Fulyun, who's the ADSA representative on the HPCSA board. And you know the irony? I was looking yesterday at Peter, Peter Bruckner's slide. She's one of the authors of the Pure Study. Yeah, one of the authors of the Pure Study. So anyway, and she, obviously she might have changed, I don't think so, but she might have changed her mind. But here is what happened. This is Tuesday, Thursday, the 30th of January, 8.50 a.m. Remember, my tweet went out on the 5th of February. So it's, it's six or seven days later. Tim Noakes' impact on the dietetics profession. Here are other examples of what other people are writing about dietitians due to the negative attention we're getting from Tim Noakes. I gave them no negative attention whatsoever. I did not criticize the dietitians at all. I just wrote the book. The article below attacks dietitians, but is written by someone else. A woman on the tweet, Tim Noakes diet targeting registered dietitians. So the complaint was really that South Africans were criticizing ADSA and they're going to target me as the, as the cause. Dear Edelweiss, just would like to follow up on the Tim Noakes problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, the bashing of the profession continues. I was not bashing the profession. And we need interventions from the HPCS as a, as a matter of urgency. As ADSA, we do not comment. But the HPCS has a much bigger clout, and we are desperate for an intervention. Thanks, Claire. Now, this lady serves on the HPCSA board. And then she, so there's still some more. Hi, Claire. Okay, this is my, I've been to a meeting. We were told clearly by the advocate, who's the senior lawyer for the HPCSA, we can't tell you what is the decision of the board. However, I can tell you that we've got a plan. We've got a plan for Dr. Nox. And so, cheers, Edelweiss. And this is now written on the 4th of June, and the trial only starts in June 2015. So this is what was happening. She was colluding, these two were colluding, and my conclusion is that this lady, because she was on the HPCSA board, colluded with those seven people to make sure that I was charged without being given my freedom of speech and right to defend myself before them. But that will come out. So, and then, so, Yelsing Stratum writes back, thank you for your email. I just feel that the process takes very long and the damage gets worse and worse. Dietitians contact me daily and I feel that I don't have support from the HPCSA. I'm glad that it's been discussed. Could you possibly give me an indication of what timelines are when we can expect action taken? Thanks. So this is a malicious prosecution. That's what it is. And so if we were to lose the case, we would win the case by simply showing this to any judge. And that was the problem. Because it's a quasi-legal case, it doesn't have the power of having a judge present. But if a judge was present, he'd say, OK, who got hurt? Who got harmed? Who's the complainant? What harm was done? 
And then we would just say, but there was collusion. And it, the case would be thrown out in, in a few hours. So in the end of the trials lasted more than four years and cost an estimated one million pounds. Yeah, unfortunately not to me, because my two lawyers gave their time for free. But perhaps its great legacy will have brought the LCHF diet to an even larger global audience. And so <laughs> So I need to thank and recognize a few people. So my wife has been absolutely extraordinary, as, as Asim knows, that we wouldn't have made it through without her support. I think she's probably the most clever woman I've ever met. And <laughs> <laughs> it, I've, been, I've known her for 50 years. We've been married for 47 years. And uh, that I just realize every day how clever she is and, and how stupid I am by comparison. <laughs> <laughs> And then this is my legal team, and I, I always cry when I talk about them. Yeah. So here's Adam. He was the, the advocate who planned the whole thing and daily worked with me and was just amazing. Uh, he was at, at school with my son, so that was the linkage. And next to him is Rocky Ramdas, who now he's my brother. We are brothers in arms. And he's, he's obviously Hindu. He's vegetarian. And so we always discuss that, but he apparently said it's not religious. He once went to, we once went to an abattoir, and he couldn't eat meat after that. So he said, you're never going to convince me. So, but he's an amazing man. Uh, he's, he's one of the great products of South Africa. He matriculated, he wrote his matric using candlesticks. He, they did not have money for lights in the house. He lived with, with three children and two parents in one room house. Yeah, astonishing man. And when he, he then became a doctor and his wife moved to Peter Maritzburg and he couldn't practice medicine, there were too many doctors there. So he said, well, I'll study law. And he studied law after hours. So in his general practice, he taught himself law and he became, uh, he became an, an advocate thereafter. And we, I mean, I just, we just love each other. That's all there is to it. <laughs> And this is Mike van der Nest, who's senior counsel, who's one of the senior lawyers in the country. He phoned me up six weeks before the trial began, and he said, I will defend you for no cost. He charges 5,000 rand per hour, yeah, which, is, which is what, 500 pounds or whatever. And he gave his time for free. And I estimate between the two of them, they probably gave me half a million pounds worth of legal advice. Yeah. Probably more, and that's and they made it possible, and so we had, uh, and we were competing with really lawyers which weren't in the same league. So there was that that group, and I'm forever thankful. So I just want you to know that behind me there stands some amazing, amazing people, and then of course there are the three angels. <laughs> <laughs> So you all know Zoe, and uh, she just destroyed the prosecution's lawyer. He just didn't have a clue where he was coming from. <laughs> she presented her PhD thesis over about a day, and he tried to cross-examine her, but just got, got nowhere. You know Nina Teichold, of course, and uh, it was even funnier with her because when she finished, he said, are you enjoying your stay in Cape Town? So she said, yes. So she said, well, I hope you'll enjoy the next few days you're here. He didn't ask her one question because <laughs> he was full. And, and this is a lady, uh, Karen Zinn, who's now in New Zealand. She was a, a UCT graduate in dietetics who I had trained. And of course, she said, you taught me to prescribe carbohydrates. <laughs> so, so the funny story is she goes to New Zealand and she goes to the Auckland University of Technology and Grant Schofield is her professor. And about five or six years ago, he comes to her and he says, Karen, you know, there's a story about this low-carb, high-fat diet. I mean, I know it's a fad, I know it's rubbish, but I have to lecture the students. Won't you just go and look into it, you see, and tell me what I should say? So Karen goes and looks at it, and she comes back a week later. She says, I'm sorry to tell you that they're right and you're wrong. I said, well, okay, we'll change then. <laughs> and now they've both written some great books, What the Fat? And, and for those of you interested in rugby, they converted the all-black rugby team to a high, higher fat diet, not a completely low carbohydrate diet, and a few other things. So that was the team. And they, they presented their, their, their information for three days. They were cross-examined for a day. 
and they, they didn't bulge. We, we didn't lose any points at all on that. So Asim has said Gandhi's his hero, Martin Luther King is one of mine. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And, and why I said that this is such an important conference? Because this matters. There's nothing in the medicine that matters more than what we're discussing here. Nothing. Yeah, absolutely nothing. All the rest is, is talking to the wall. And this is the elephant in the room. And in time, it will be realized. But we just got to keep fighting. And I always finish, of, finish up on another story. Which... <laughs> <laughs> so it's for Peter and for all of us from Liverpool and all of us from England. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank They did it.